got somebody who thinks he's tough as a nickel steak. But they all come to speed for the do re me. Now get this. We ain't partners. We ain't brothers and we ain't friends. My little brother was 15 years old. Think about that. You're waiting for no. How about cutting hate? Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're a real smart boy, ain't you? I guess maybe you'll have to kill me. A little hurt if I do. Well, looks like I finally ran into someone that likes to play as rough as I do. Yeah, this must be a lucky night. And my body, they're not nice like me. Are we supposed to say thanks? You're not supposed to say nothing, soldier. We ain't partners. We ain't brothers and we ain't friends. I'm putting you down and keeping you down until Gans is locked up or dead. And if Gans gets away, you're going to be sorry you ever met me. I'm already sorry. Nick Nolte is a cop. Eddie Murphy is a con. I can help you get Gans, but you got to get me out of here first. You're crazy. He pulls some strings. See, how you needed me a little more than you thought, huh, Mr. K? He pulls some scams. So where do you want to do it, honey? Want to hop up on the counter? No, we can go in this room over here next to the bathroom. Give me a break. Right. I'm dead serious. Come on, we're on the move. Let's go. They've got two killers to track down. Toss me that piece, and he won't waste him. They've got a kidnapping going down. I want the money. I don't know what you're talking about. I want that Indian to snap her neck. They've got a fortune to hunt down. I want to know what's going on between you and Gans. Half a million dollars. And it's all coming down in 48 hours. But I gave you 48 hours to come up with something and the clock's running. This guy got a real itchy trigger finger and he's a nervous cop. You better listen to him because your brain's blown out. I'm the calm type. <laughs> For a good old boy by the name of Billy Bear. Never heard of him. Heard of him now, man? You know, you are real stupid for a cop, man. You're following this guy too close. Yeah, well, most cops are pretty stupid, but since you landed in jail, what the hell does that make you? Captain Luther, I'm sorry about the door, man. Did that hurt? It looked real painful. You come clean and we're going again right here, right now. Are you in some hurry or something? Yes, I'm in a hurry. I haven't done anything for three years. Oh, you used to be a priest or something. This ain't my night. If you screw up, I can promise you. You're going down. They couldn't like each other less. They couldn't need each other more. You want to bet? And if they can get off each other's case. Look at you. You got a $500 suit on. You're still a low life. Yeah, but I look good. They just might solve this one. Being a cop is a hard job, Jack. Nick Nolte, Eddie Murphy. We ain't brothers, we ain't partners, and we ain't friends. And if Dan gets away with my money, you're going to be sorry you ever met me. I'm already sorry. 48 hours. Y'all be cool. Hello, folks. This is The Last Call of Torchies. I am uh, one of your hosts, Gary Hill. Uh, as you know, this is, um, it's been a while since we recorded this, probably a good month or so. So, just to remind you, this is the uh, only podcast that, that fulfills your, fulfills your needs and, and wants for, for uh, das, das Wunderkind, uh, Walter, I'm not even sure if he's German or not. I'm just, I'm just gonna throw it out there because he, he's um he's done a lot of stuff in his films, writing, producing, directing, all that stuff. Um, but with me, as always, is Mr. Cameron Scott. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Looking forward to this one a lot. Uh, love me some. Stories. Cool. And with me uh, as well, from north of the border, Mr. Lee Russell. How you doing, sir? I'm not a convict, so uh, I guess I'm doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> not yet, right? <laughs> yeah, not yet. Anyway. Yeah, we're here to discuss uh, tonight uh, the next one in, in the, the echelon of the Walter Hill Pantheon. That's a lot of big words there with a lot of syllables. Um, <laughs> 48 Hours from 1982. Uh, this, of course, stars Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte. Uh, Eddie Murphy's first um, big thing, you know, past Saturday Night Live. And um, this also stars some names you may know. Uh, Nettle Tool is, uh, is Elaine, who's... Uh, 
Jack Cates, who's Nick Nolte's uh, lady. Uh, Frank McRae uh, as the captain. Uh, James Remar as Gans. You're a uh, bad guy. <clears throat> back again, I, I should mention that. David Patrick Kelly as well, back again as, as Luther. Sonny Landon back again as Billy Bear. Uh, Brian James back again as Kehoe, who's um, Jack Cates' like partner. A lot of back agains in this movie. I love it. Um, mm -hmm. Jonathan Banks shows up in this movie. Probably his, his first and only uh, Walter Hill, if I had to guess. And um, Mar Mar Margot Rose as Casey, Denise Crosby as Sally. And I, I gotta say, Denise Crosby looking pretty tasty in this movie. So there there's that. And uh, she looks I'll very good. That. Yeah. And um. Yeah, it's, it's directed by R R R Walter Hill, and um, had a good handful of writers here, uh, including Walter Hill, uh, Roger Spottiswood, Stephen E. D Stephen E. D Souza, who would go on to do a whole bunch of things, and uh, Larry Gross, and uh, what was this? Spottiswood, he directed Terror Train, did not? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. 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 Go, go Canada, brother. You know, man, oh man. We'll just get right into this now, and uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Cameron his his, his first uh, impressions, first thoughts, or whatever on uh, this this Stone Cold classic. Uh, well, this one holds a lot of nostalgia factor for me. I remember seeing this way 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 too young. I must have been seven or eight. Once again, I had a very cool mother who allowed me to see whatever I wanted to see, and I remember thinking Nick Nolte was the biggest, baddest motherfucker that I'd ever <laughs> seen, at least <laughs> at the time. He was gruff, you know, and the ying to his yang was Eddie Murphy and Reggie Hammond. Man, he was just fucking hilarious. I wasn't really familiar with him, you know, uh, on Saturday Night Live because I just didn't stay up that late at that time. But, yeah, th this movie is the, you know, the ge not really the genesis of the buddy cop film, but it's the one, I think, that by which all others should be judged. You know, I mean, uh, buddy cop films have become a mainstay in the 80s and 90s, you know, with, I could I could name off 100 others, but I won't do that here. But yeah, I, I think this movie has a little bit of everything that we all love. It's got, you know, the, the rough and gruff uh, Jack Cates, the funny as hell Reggie Hammond, and that O'Toole is, is uh, very cute. Um, Frank McRae is the, the main reason to show up in this. I think, you know, uh, he made a career out of playing roles like these. I think especially with, like, Last Action Hero, you know, he uh, played a, a big-time caricature of that kind of role. Mm -hmm. But it's got a little bit of everybody, and it's like everybody, you blink, and it's just like, oh, you know, Sonny Landham, blink. Oh, James Remar, blink. Oh, there's Brian James. It's the who's who of the 80s. And, and uh, it's just kind of sad to, to think that this is the only uh, Walter Hill film, and I, I think you're right, Gary. It is the only Walter Hill film that uh, Jonathan Banks ever did, unless there's one that I'm forgetting about. But it's, uh, again, it holds a lot of uh, nostalgia factor watching this with my, my mother, watching this with my grandparents. Uh, it was one of the few movies that we could all agree on, you know, which, which is really weird when you think about it, the three generations of people that we had there, between my grandparents, my mother, and myself. Um, I love it. I love it as much today as I did back then, and that might be a little bit of the nostalgia talking, but it's just a great, it's a great buddy cop film. Like I said, it's uh, the one by which all others, uh, you know, should be judged against. I forgot to mention the Bus Boys because, as Eddie Murphy said in Delirious, the the Bus Boys be fucking because you know they they, 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 they do anything that moves. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is the band that that is in. Um... I, I, I forget what the, what the bar was called. It wasn't Torchies, but Torchies shows up in this movie, too. Um, <laughs> Isn't this the second appearance of Torchies? <laughs> second or third. In the Walter Hill universe. Yeah. yeah. Um, kick it to Lee. Uh, this is the first time watch for me. Um, what? Some, somehow I've seen the sequel several times over, and I never get around to watching this one. The sequel was always on TV for me, so... That one I fondly remember. I fondly remember uh, Kitten uh, Natavidad's uh, breasts get a motorcycle driven through on the big screen in the in the sequel. Uh, <laughs> um, although you know, luckily enough, uh, watching the sequel, I kind of did see this film because the sequel is kind of a carbon copy of of this, and this is sort of the more rougher, gruffer, um, slightly more mean spirited version of that film it feels like um and definitely a bit more funnier 
uh, I, I do like, like, I'm not a big fan of the buddy cop uh, sort of genre, but um, I can see why this sort of kicked it off into, into high gear because uh, Nolte and uh, Murphy play off each other really, really well. Um, uh, you know, Nick Nolte's, you can barely understand what he's saying half the time. It's just like, eh, eh. <laughs> and then and Eddie Murphy's just sort of, you know, riffing off that apparently most of the dialogue they had in between each other's kind of improvised from what i understand that's what murphy said in a uh uh interview a few years back but um yeah this was a, a good first time watch like i said i'm not a big fan of the genre but um i enjoyed it quite a bit and i'm sure we'll get into the details here but uh yeah uh, it was a it was a good first time watch yeah yeah much like lee we, we we say inappropriate things a little too early and um yeah, I saw this pretty young, and like Lee said, though, another 48 hours probably played on cable uh, a ton, so I could see, much like what, why I saw Phantasm 2 in, in Ghoulies 2 before I seen the, the first ones. You know, they, they, they played them a bunch. Yeah. Uh, so there ain't no shame in that at all, and um, I hope when it comes to the time I can get a... Uh, Andrew Divoff some contact info because he he really enjoys talking about their role in that movie so it could be a thing you know nice. um nice enough guy but um this, this film though you know I, I I this time around you, you notice a lot of them you know the grit thing that's not really there and like like a normal like buddy cop comedy because there's a lot of a lot of drama in there too because at the end of the day. Um, Reggie Hammond is a guy that was part of this gang. Uh, they killed the only guy I, I guess he cared about because he knows that Gans and Billy Bear are crazy, and it, there's a lot of compassion there. And but for this to be like his first, like big film, you know, coming out of the gate, you could tell you could tell from SNL he was going to be a star if you re rewatch some of those segments because he's it just seems so effortless to him. And uh, warning if you're <laughs> racially sensitive and. You should be. Um, Jack Cates throws some throws some some words at at at, um, at Reggie Hammond that that you may not enjoy, calling him huh. watermelon or a straight up N word, and you know it, it's. I'd say N -word. hey. He pretty, he pretty much reads the whole book, doesn't yeah, he? Like, yeah. Goddamn. I I, I yeah. hate to say hey, it's the early eighties. One of them multiple times. Right. <laughs> I'd hate to say that that use that that, that terminology. It's the early eighties, you know, but it it still don't make it right in. It's it's there, but yeah, it doesn't really stray me away from saying, "Hey, you know, I I could cancel this movie right now." And no, I'm not going to do that. But um, d damn enjoyable, uh, great use of um, the Los Angeles uh, area for for one thing. Um, 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 um and a great opening too. I got to say. So um, let's uh, talk about. <laughs> Some key key stuff in the film that we we enjoy. Let's talk about that opening because the whole chain gang thing, where Billy rolls up. You don't know who he is quite yet, and it's it, it's done very well. And um, because he even he even uh, James Remar's Gans is throwing some slurs at him, you know, just just to create a diversion, of course, because they're boys, and you get some great. Tonto. Yeah, call them Tonto and. You talk about fire water and stuff like that, and it, it's 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 there, but um, again a diversion, and you get some great squibs here, and a, a, a great opening, and I I gotta I gotta say if you kick it off something like that, you're not, you're not quite sure what's going on, and you, you be Jack Cates, and he's just this gruff gruff dude, and who somehow lands in that old tool, I have no idea. He must uh be hanging the high hard one or something, you know, just uh. <laughs> Yeah. I can suspend my disbelief for a lot, but I can't suspend it for that at all. <laughs> Especially the way he treats her. It's like, wow, you could do so much better. You could do way better. And I, I guess I guess there was more in Neto Tool in the original like version of the script or something like that, but here her her role is like barely a supporting role. Like it's she's almost a cameo more than anything else, which is unfortunate. Yeah, it's true. She gets about as much screen time as um Denise Crosby, the other lady I mentioned, who, um, we have, of course, that it, it, I, I love, um, the way that Eddie Murphy is brought, brought into the film. It's, it's, it's pretty iconic and it, it, it makes you want to sing that police song badly, just like him. And, uh, 
how one um, gets the leather easy chair in their cell, I'll, I'll never guess, you know, because he's not there for a, you know, for a short time, but uh must be really minimum security for him to have the, the digs that he has set up in their prison cell. Or maybe people know who his friends are. <laughs> he, they happen to know that uh, 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 Billy Bear and uh, what's-his-face are fucking crazy, and if he gets fucked with, they might get fucked with. I don't know. Could be, it, man. That it was just the 80s. Yeah, it was just the <laughs> 80s. You know, let's, let's make him look really cool. He's, he's a talent. Let's, let's make him look cool. Although, I was reading some of the background on this, and it's like, weirdly enough, like they didn't think Eddie Murphy was funny enough at first in the movie. Like, I read that they, too. That's nuts. Yeah, and they had to punch him up a little bit, and I think it kind of shows in the way the movie plays out because the movie's very edgy and it's very much skirting the line between let's just go hyper violent cop thriller and let's go comedy. Like it sometimes you kind of it, the movie kind of forgets that there's a comedic undertone to it and it starts getting like really nasty. And it's like oh okay, so uh, it feels like yeah they're they're punching up the comedy here and there and especially in places like the uh you know the the torchy scene where, where torchies in this movie is a fucking redneck bar full of racists and uh eddie murphy you know shows them all up and pretends he's a fucking cop and gets some info out of them you know and um, i i forgot to mention peter jason is the bartender in this movie yeah yeah i'm sorry continue oh it's just um I think that's all I had to say, but it was just, it, it, it is, it is weird. Like it, it, it does feel like there was uh, some sort of, you know, post-production stuff or reshoots or something done that was, you know, just to punch things up a little bit because uh, at times it feels like a totally different movie. Um, but I, I think it, you know, Walter Hill and everyone else behind this is just talented enough to keep it on track. So even when it does sort of stray off into like, Ooh, we're getting like serious eighties cop drama, they always sort of rein it back enough, so it, it's it, it never it never uh, quite loses its focus. So I, I thought it was pretty good. Well, if if you look at who worked on the writing of the film, you got you got Walter Hill, and then you got S- Steve D'Souza, who in just a few short years would do Commando. It's, it's um, yeah. Who else in this will do Commando? Uh, <laughs> well, for 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 uh, I'm not even talking about the actors. I'm talking about fucking James Horner basically just lifting his score from this for Commando. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Totally. I remember picking that up when I was a kid and I was just look, remember looking at my mother and was like, are they using the music from 48 hours in this? Yeah. Like, like, I thought, uh, you know, they were ripping them off and then I realized it was the same artist. I'm like, well, okay. I mean, I guess that's, you can recycle your own work. It's not exactly plagiarism, but it's yeah. still strange. You know what the score needs? More tin drums. Keep playing them things, you know? Just more, uh, what, Caribbean steel drum. Yeah, steel drums. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, Cameron, um, stuff that stands out to you, sir. You know, really, I think the the end scene towards towards the end when Reggie is in the bar and they've kind of given up on what, on trying to find Gans and he is just constantly trying to get laid <laughs> is the hands down, you know, the the funniest scene in the movie. Either that or the scene of Torchies. The, the scene of Torchies where Reggie, you know, Eddie Murphy is Reggie just kind of goes off into his good cop, bad cop routine. You know, it's just, mm-hmm. it shows him with trying to fake this bravado for somebody who is, you know, pretty much shaken in his boots the entire time and, and scared. He, he he can turn on the charm when he wants to. And I, I think really though, that the scene at the end toward, like I said, towards the end at the bar with the, uh, the bus boys and everything. And he's just, you know, that guy is hit, that hitting on his girl that he's got his eyes set on and he opens up his, you know, his, uh, suit and he's got the gun. The guy just kind of looks at it like, <laughs> I'm still not scared of you, man. You could hit yeah. me with all six of those bullets and I'm still going to get you. Uh, <laughs> it's just Eddie Murphy being a, a, a crazy loudmouth in this movie, man. I, I love the Reggie Hammond character. It's just and to think that, you know, that one of the word I'm looking for is this, this the breakout role for him, you know, to come out of the gate with a movie like 48 Hours. We, you know, should all be so lucky to have like a, a project like that. Mm. And it, I mean, it it does make him like a, a star, right? Like it, it really shows off how good he is and it makes him very likable, even if he is like, you know, a 
just just a street thug in a expensive suit, you know, like fucking right. Nolte at one point, you know, mentions, oh, you got a five hundred dollar suit, but you're still a cheap thug, you know, and so well, at least I look good, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, I do like how they especially make Nolte such a shithead that it it helps make Murphy look better. Um, and Nolte is, I wouldn't say he's a flat out racist. I'd say he's, you know, kind of a bigoted cop who has a lot of the bigotry, a lot of even good cops will have, uh, to some extent from, you know, just working cases and working the streets and stuff. And he sort of comes around to Murphy, like the whole, the whole thing between them is that they're not even like, it, it's, it, it's funny this, this set off buddy cops when these two are definitely not buddies. They're, they hate each oh, other. No. Like they fucking hate each other. And, um, they do kind of become buddies at the end though. Like they kind of earn each other's respect. They have a fight at one point that it's not quite Roddy Piper versus Keith David, but it's starting to get there. <laughs> oh yeah. It gets pretty rough. Yeah. So like there, there's a lot of good stuff in this. Uh, like there's no, I'd say there's no fat on the script at all. Like everything in here is really good and it's only 90 minutes. So it's like, wow, they, they do, they do manage to pack a lot of good stuff into this. Yeah. I think it's interesting that, you know, his first big che- paycheck in this movie, it says on on the DB here that it's $450,000 uh, c- compared to Nick Nolte's $1 million for this movie. But when they made a sequel, he made $7 million compared to Nick Nolte's $3 million because he was a much more bigger star at that point. Uh, and yeah. I'm not saying that Nick Nolte wasn't a big star. It's just at that point in their careers, he was a much bigger star. Yeah. Um, th- You mentioned the scene. Uh, I love the scene at the police station where the prostitutes come in and he uh, saunters over to them to, to tr- try to get busy in the police station. <laughs> put, put the moves out of it. Yeah. The, the line that, that it, I, I still use on occasion. Uh, I, my dick gets hard when the wind blows. It's <laughs> I've been in prison for three years. My dick gets hard when the wind blows. Yeah. Um, I, I just like the I like the yelling police chief. Yeah, hell yeah. That's that's my favorite character in this and because every scene you see him, he's a bit louder. <laughs> it's like I'm gonna talk to you loudly now, god damn it! And don't you do this and you do that and shut the door behind you. And I'm gonna talk even louder the next time you see me, damn it! See, Cameron mentioned the last action hero, which is a film that people will can take or leave. Uh, I'll take it. I'll take it 90, 90 times over over anything else sometimes because the people that were making that movie and the way they wrote the script and the way they wrote Frank McRae in that movie, they got it and Frank got it, okay? There was a little smoke coming out of his ears in that movie <laughs> <laughs> when he was speaking gibberish. And um, there, there's a Academy Award winners in that movie. You guys should check it out if you haven't seen Last Action Hero. It's, it's fun. Um, yeah, I love that movie. I don't care what anybody says. I unabashedly love that movie. Yeah, it's fun. The the fuse on the the dynamite that doesn't go out just keeps burning. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of lines that I I tend to use on my day to day life is the whole uh, you know Jack tell me a story fuck you Ooh, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> my wife will throw that one back and forth at each other all the time. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's good. Um, the hotel shootout scene is done really well where they they find out. Because, of course, they, they steal somebody's credit card to, to get a hotel room, so they get found out real fast. Billy Bear and Gans. Mm. And the, um, it's done really well. And I, I think that I read somewhere on here, too, that James Remar would go without sleep to look crazier. And I, I think that him looking so, especially that, that scene where he's wearing, I don't know what kind of shirt that is. It, it's, it's like some kind of wool something, so you just look extra sweaty and... Yeah. yeah, exhausted and on uh, un, on un, un, you know just lit and he he's he's holding the the, um, the clerk hostage and of course it, he throws there are a lot of bullets that they tell Jack to throw him his gun and they they won't they won't shoot his friend of course he shoots his friend his his cop friend Jonathan Banks gets shot and killed in this movie mm-hmm. and um it's the squibs a, uh, oh, I'm sorry I was just gonna say it's just it, it's a it's a weird moment because you know like. Jonathan Banks is like almost crying and he's like, you don't do that for me. But Jack is just like, no, nope, I'm going to throw it on my gun. And it gets his, it gets his ass killed anyway. It's just like, yeah. it, it's directed in only the way that Walter Hill can direct a shootout. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of, it's one of Hill's sort of specialties, like doing these sort of 
sort of close action scenes where people are shooting at each other and shit. Like it, it's just, it's one of his things he does so well. And, and he, he spaces it around this movie a little bit, you know, there's, there's actually not a lot of shooting in this movie, but uh, when, when it happens, it's effective. And what a tonal difference from the previous movie to this, from something mm-hmm. like Southern comfort, which had little to no humor, what whatsoever in it, what's I mean, none at all except for maybe a few dry humor type jokes to this m- movie where you know it's a weird kind of 50 50 is a salty mix you know of, of yeah. the, the action and grittiness with you know the humor but what a tonal difference from southern comfort to 48 hours yeah i'll be right back guys yeah keep this conversation going um i think it's interesting the way where his career went uh walter hill you know kind of gives himself a little credit here to say that Without forty eight hours, that there really wouldn't have been a Beverly Hills Cop, and I think he's not he's not incorrect about that. But at the same time, you know, Eddie Murphy helped create a character there, and he, he I'm sure he, he but he he lifted some stuff from from um for from Reggie Hammond, but um created an icon really <clears throat> to where I, I will still sit through that terrible third Beverly Hills Cop film, which people people say it's terrible, and I, I I'll still enjoy parts of it but part- yeah, I enjoy parts of it but it, it it pales in comparison to the first two it, it's 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 kind of like a like rob zombies uh you know three from hell it's just like it's it's passable it is and it's all right but it's just like it's the lesser of the, th- <laughs> the three movies by a long shot yep the, the second wall is my favorite one i think yep yep same same the- Right down to the the the, the Bob Seger song, which I still listen to on occasion, just to just to turn it on. Yeah, yeah, you gotta gotta kind of turn that up to eleven when that song comes on. Yep, so, so much heavy saxophone. <laughs> um, it's it's cool if you look if you look at the the real. I mentioned the LA locations before. IMDb does you a solid and and tells you uh, where all the cool places are. So if you ever want to know the address, the Torchies, you can go on INDB and they will tell you that you can get to that Torchies bar, obviously. But um, where is the damn thing at? Here we go. <laughs> Filming locations. Torchies bar is at 218 and a half West 5th Street, downtown Los Angeles. So if you ever want to go there and look at, you know, Torchies without the, t- the Torchies neon sign and if it's still open, of course, COVID restrictions, uh, you, you may be able to go visit that bar. So there's something, you, something new you don't learn every day. Uh, <laughs> prob- probably a lot less racist and, and unfortunately, probably a lot less women dancing around in pasties and little else. But Man, who would want that, though, for sure, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Get it in, guys. Oh, my gosh. But uh, it, 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 it's weird. This film, it's it's deemed a comedy in, in most people's eyes because, you know, you should laugh at certain points of this movie. But there's also that, like, um, it's got, like, a 70s feel to it as far as, like, the, the, the those old cop movies go from the 70s. Like, a right. new, new Centurions or there's a whole lot of you can mention. But Freebie and the Bean. Freebie and the Bean. They, they 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 mentioned they I mean they they mentioned they they manage manage was what I was looking for to um mix those two worlds together and I think that Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy together help uh push that um to make to make you laugh but also make you realize that this is a very serious situation that they're in here because they they're trying to catch these guys. It, Reggie's trying to get the the money that he had uh, stolen uh, or invested in the gang, which is in this car that he has stored away since he got in prison. And L- Luther wants it to to get his girl back, obviously. And it's 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 a real sticky situation, and you get some genuine laughs in here. But with, with you know the gritty, like dirty like kind of almost like noir s- stuff in this movie sometimes yeah yeah so what what was your guys vote um does does luther's girlfriend get killed off screen oh yeah. definitely oh yeah yeah, yeah. cuz i i think uh old billy bear shot her mhm cuz there's two gunshots on the bus right and one of them is like when it cuts away so yeah yeah i always, always always came to the assumption that yeah that billy bear had shot her mhm and speaking of Billy Bear, what an intense fucking movie for uh, 
Sunday Landon. He just looked like he was raged out of his freaking mind, like you know. He's fucking crazy. <laughs> he's, he's just he's just totally psychotic in this film. This is, you know, at one point Eddie Murphy's pointing a gun at his ass and. He just pulls his knife and just starts coming at Eddie Murphy. Just laughs and smiles and is like, "I'm coming to catch you." And gets gunned down, but it's like no fear, just just nuts. No, no, no. That man <laughs> didn't have, wouldn't had a, no pun intended, wouldn't had fear of a grizzly bear if it came up upon him. <laughs> mm-hmm. He'd have just pulled out his knife just like he did in uh, Predator a couple of years later, and he'd have just faced it down, with, you know, with a knife and been like, "This is how I go down." Mm-hmm. Yeah, like come and get some, and then I die and scream like a girl in Predator, you know, which, is a, <laughs> which is an unceremoniously uh, off-screen death for 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 old Sonny Landham in Predator, because he screams like a woman when he when he dies, and that's uh you, you don't want that from your Sonny Landham. No, that's a bozo no no right there. <laughs> I, I got another question about um, Luther's girlfriend. How many times do you think she was uh, plowed by our by our villains here? Um, unfortunately, probably several times. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. with with these two. <laughs> yeah, probably hourly. But but they they did, they did give her a courtesy to to call women to the hotel though. So uh, yeah. it's like uh, I want I want Indian for my friend here. No, no not not with a turban. He, he uh, a squaw, <laughs> as he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remar and Landham are just really good bad guys in this though. They're just really just gross. They're, they're fucking, you want to see them get, get theirs. They're just skeezy. They're, they're, mm-hmm. You have to feel like you're going to get, you know, gone of her precipitates just by touching them. <laughs> but, but there is that part in the hotel scene where Study land and busts in the room because he's in another, another room, obviously. And he's clean, he's clean shaven. He's got a nice shirt on. Like, he's ready to rock and roll. You know? Mm-hmm. Which is probably the cleanest you see anybody in this movie is is uh, right there. Everybody felt very sticky and sweaty and gritty in this movie. Yeah, even Nick Nolte, you know, is just dirty. He's it's unkept. <laughs> well, after after his fight with Eddie Murphy, he's, he's got like dried blood just on his lower lip that he doesn't even bother to like clean off. It's like okay. Yeah, he, I feel like the if you take Eddie Murphy out of this out of the, the equation. If like I saw that he was like their fourth or fifth pick, and I think uh, they said they had, you know, auditioned at Richard Pryor and then a young uh, Denzel Washington. If you would have put somebody like Denzel into this movie, it would have changed the dynamic of it, and it wouldn't have been a buddy cop movie or um, the, even a you know a, a comedy action flick. It would have been just straight up action uh, drama. I think you take Eddie Murphy out of the equation, you, you you're missing your your comedic element. Yeah. And, I I mean, I've been surprised before. Me, me and Lee covered Street Smart uh, in one of the Beef Out of the Cannon episodes, and oh, yeah. Morgan Freeman's debut as Fast Black, uh, the the pimp who will, who will cut you with a yuhu bottle, is mm-hmm. something to behold if you haven't seen it before. But it is something you would not, not expect. Yeah, you just gotta watch that. Was <laughs> it called Street Smart? Street Smart. All right, making a note of it, gentlemen. I will watch it. That's the uh, that's the film Christopher Reeve got to make. Uh, by agreeing to do Superman 4 for canon. No. Oh. <laughs> okay. This is a really good movie, though. Ever made. <laughs> man. Nucle- nuclear Man. <laughs> oh, man. That was a fun discussion. Uh, that included uh, g- give me two million from Gene Hackman to do the voice of Nuclear Man. It's, 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 um... Yeah. <laughs> I'm Nuclear Man. So good. So bad. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You don't watch a movie like that because it's good. You watch it because it's bad. You see, as 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 a kid though, I was convinced that it was good, which is the sad, part, the sad part to me. Well, I was I was convinced at one time that Superman three was the best one of the bunch, and you know, and it, it's, we all know about how the movie is aged is definitely not the best of the three. <laughs> well, I mean, if you only watch Superman three and four, there's definitely. <laughs> Superman four right. jumps right off the cliff. Like, <clears throat> so, I, I, I didn't expect to get a Superman conversation, but I, I, I have a lot of fun with Superman three. I mean, there's 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 enough in there. There's enough meat in there to enjoy it, and it's the only film where you you get Bizarro and in a Superman movie. Yeah. It <laughs> um soups flicking peanuts at a bar glass window, breaking shit. <laughs> uh, yeah. All soups fucking getting drunk in a, in a little dive bar. That could have been Torchies for all we know. Could be. Could be. 
Um, back to 48 Hours, though. Um, a lot of meat in this movie. I, I, I gotta say, there's the, like Lisa said, it's a clean hour, 36 minutes. There's not a lot of waste in there at all. They're pretty much uh, on the, the make once they once you know the players and the plot. It, it doesn't really slow down, and you, you get a lot of fun stuff in, in, a, in a film debut from Eddie Murphy. You, you could tell he was going to be a star uh, f f from this movie, and it, it, it proved it because in three years you had this movie. You had uh, Trading Places in 83, which is a holiday staple for me. And Beverly Hills Cop in '84, so you know, hit after hit after hit. You could tell that his star was uh, rising, and it was rising fast. Because even on SNL, you could tell he was just you know not not sl not slumming it there, but he, he was he, waiting to break out. You know, yeah, he was too big for that cast at that point. Like he was just <clears throat> this guy needs to go somewhere else quick. James Brown celebrity hot tub party. You know, <laughs> good, good shit. I'm gumpy, yeah. damn it. Ow, too hot in the hot tub. Good shit. Oh, what else? Velvet Jones. There's so many classic Eddie Murphy characters that you can love. And uh, and I, I love that he, you know, was kind of res reserved because he was he played the outrageous, you know, characters uh, on Saturday Night Live. You know, the the, the characters that would would um, <clears throat> not play today. It, it, some of them. Um, mm. <laughs> as Jesse Jackson singing High Me Town, which is a racial slur for a Jew, which would not happen today. In a... I think I think even buckwheat's kind of yeah yeah well yeah uh, our gang as a, as a collective um I gotta get those Blu-rays one day they put they restored them all on Blu-ray the, the the our gang shorts and much like um peanuts like the Charlie Brown stuff. I respect a lot of the ways they, they did things on the show, but it, it, it's it's that's a that's a whole tragic story in itself, the our gang story. But um, mm. yeah, it, yeah a lot, a lot of questionable. Again, <laughs> it's it's the early '80s. People, come on, man, you you can go on the screen and call a black guy a watermelon, but no, that's that's not true. It's just it's not an excuse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm gonna kick it to Cameron and ask him uh, any final thoughts, any final things you have to say about 48 Hours before we kick off. Oh, God. Well, first off, if, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen it, uh, <clears throat> shame on you. If, you, you know, if you're if you listening to this podcast and you haven't watched 48 Hours before, go out and watch it. Not that I'm putting you on the spot, Lee. I have not seen it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, definitely don't watch uh, another 48 Hours first and then come into this one. It, it you know It's a much lesser of a sequel. It's, it's a good film, but it's not a great film. But 48 Hours is classic. It's it's part of my you know uh, despite some of the, the the problems that it has you know with language and and some racial stuff, it's still a classic film. It's got everybody in it. I love them. I've, it's even you know like uh, you said earlier, Gary. You know having the, the bus boys in it and Ola Ray in it. Uh, you know from uh, the Thriller music video and Peter Jason. Everybody in this is somebody that you recognize. And if you're especially if you're traveling in our our circle, you definitely, you, you know, you know, everybody, <clears throat> you know, everybody in this movie. Yeah. It, it's such a great supporting cast. Everybody's top notch. It's a very tight film. We've already kind of mentioned that is it's a tight, you know, hour and a half, hour and 35 minutes long. And, and there never feels like there's any, like there's any kind of uh, footage that's really fluffy. There's nothing, uh, you know, superfluous. It's just, it's very, very tight. Everything direct from one scene to the next it's, it's a great film and i think it's one of uh hill's best you know and that this i think it's just bears mentioning that he went from you know southern comfort to show you the 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 change here from southern comfort some something like that to 48 hours and <laughs> just that tonal difference is a very prolific guy but that's why we're here for for torches because he walter hill is a prolific guy but this is uh Definitely a top five Walter Hill film for me. Cool, uh, Lee. First time watch. Uh, f f final final thoughts and yeah, all that good stuff. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if I put it a uh, top five, but I really enjoyed it. Um, we'll see what happens with uh, rewatches. So, like, I, I actually just watched it before we recorded the podcast here, so I'm pretty fresh on it. Um, and uh, I enjoyed it. I mean, I'm always 
I'm, I'm not the a super big Eddie Murphy fan, but I thought he was really, really good in this. Uh, it's probably one of his best roles I've seen him in. Um, big time Nick Nolte fan, and he's really good in this. Especially just got to give him credit playing such an unlikable piece of shit, too. Like, he, <laughs> he, he has no qualms doing that. And, like, he's, he is just not likable. He's, he's grumpy. He's a bigot. He's violent. Uh, he, he's, he's he not, treats his lady like shit. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 chicken. He's sort of ticking off all the all the boxes uh, of a person I don't like. But um, he still ends up being kind of likable by the end, just because he sort of comes around to uh, Eddie Murphy, and Eddie Murphy kind of makes him a bit of a better person, I guess, in, in a way. Um, yeah, no, I enjoyed this quite a bit. Uh, you know, it would like I said, it wouldn't be top five for me, but it's it's definitely near the upper tier of the stuff I've watched from Walter Hill. Uh, it's pretty flawless, and um, it, it really it comes down to I'm not a big buddy cop fan, so it's just not my genre. But it, as far as stuff from this genre that I've seen, this is so, some of the best. So uh, if you haven't seen it, go see it. Yeah, I, I dig it. Yeah, you know, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's probably in my top five either, but it's right there, edge of, edge of the top five. Um, you can see just by watching Eddie Murphy, you know how flawless he is as as a performer and why why it became the the star that he was. And uh, I will say one of the biggest of the nineteen eighties. If if not if not, you know he, he he's probably in the top five of of eighty stars that whose stars rose very very fast. Him. Schwarzenegger, you know, Mel Gibson's probably on that list. Uh, mm. I don't know who else you'd throw in there, but it's it's amazing. And it, it seems so flawless just watching from this first, you know, major film performance that was thrown at him, uh, how effortless it seems to, to work with, especially a seasoned actor like Nick Nolte, who's been doing this for, for a little while before him and them playing off each other as well as they do. And... A, like you said, able to improv. That comes from that comedy background, you know, him able to improv. And that would drive certain people crazy. I've heard stories from, from different sets, like uh, like Misery, to where Kathy Bates was a theater person. So all they did was, was rehearse and rehearse, rehearse, yeah. rehearse some more. And James Conn's like, let's go. <laughs> you know, and that's, <laughs> and that's it, you know? Yeah. Uh, um, but you could tell that improv influence is there and experience is there. And it really sh shines on the screen. Um, with, with with the great villains, and I, I love that mm -hmm. James Remar went all in by by not sleeping just to look more rugged and you know out of his mind, and has a fitting ending to to, to the movie. And when you get into the the second part of this, Nick Nolte is kind of an asshole again. To, to, to after all they've been through, he's like, yeah, you know, I I. I there's a point where Eddie Murphy's car is is all dirty and stuff on the street. Like you did to my car. Well, like, yeah, it's just it's been sitting there all the time. What, what, what do you want? You know, stuff like that. And hmm. <laughs> if you see the film, that car explodes. Uh, yeah, because hmm. somebody somebody wants to kill him in this movie too. But good times. You know, much more grittier than I remember. Um, it's 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 the early '80s. They so kind of mixed that world of. You know, just past the seventies and going into the eighties, you know, and I I think it does it it works that fine line so well with um with all the input it had in the writing, it's it's a nice it's a nice mix, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that and kick it to my friends here, Cameron. Uh, what do you have coming up, my friend? Oh uh, well, I'm getting ready to uh, that cinema degeneration where I release all my shows. I'm getting ready to to debut a new show called Sinfully Short Sundays, a little short mini, like 15, 20 minute review session. I'm going to do a one-on-one -on -one with somebody and do a quickie review for movies that maybe don't deserve the in-depth treatment. <laughs> and uh, coming up here in, well, in three days on Tuesday, I will be releasing my hundredth episode at Cinema Degeneration. Wow. So I got that going for me, which is nice. Yeah, in two, two and a half years, I, I don't know where the where the time has gone, but <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's flown. Some folks show these 40 episodes in those two years, so it, it happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's uh, all I got going on that's new. I'm like, really, like I said, releasing the, that new show and got the 100th episode coming out, so I've been uh, pretty busy. I got a film project coming up. 
was supposed to shoot sometime in the uh, end of March, beginning of April. So hopefully they, they raised their funds. I don't want to announce it in case things don't go well, but it's supposed like supposed to, I'm using air quotes here that you can't see, but they're supposed to shoot uh, last week of March, beginning week of April. Yes. I, I talk with my hands off and while I'm on the microphone, so don't feel too bad about that, okay? You know, yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> that's 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 the guinea in me. We talk with my hands. Yeah, that's it's a <laughs> I'm half Sicilian, so I'm oh, there with Well you. there you go. See, yeah. <laughs> Lee, what about you, my friend? Um Unfortunately, not too much coming up uh, for me, uh, at least uh, this month. Um, February's been a bit of a shit show. Uh, at the very least, going to have one more episode out for They Must Be Destroyed on Site, where we'll be covering uh, Danger Diabolic uh, from back in the in the 60s, Mario Bava film. Um, planning on recording that tomorrow night, actually. And uh, so that'll be out sometime before February's over. And should be another blood on the tracks episode by the end of february and that's about all that's coming out for me right now yeah the, the lees be working man be busy busy yeah. busy she's doing like fucking 13 hour days as of late oh uh, geez at, at her job and she's got school i barely fucking get to talk to her half the time now so my, my heart goes out to you let her know i said that because it's uh it does mm. uh yeah, me, myself, um, new project I should mention first, myself and Heather Powell got together and uh, we made a list of uh, films that neither of us have never seen before and you can listen to our first episode about Don't Torture a Duckling on a new show on the Intestinal Fortitude Network called Untapped Gems. Um, I'm very proud of the first episode. Next episode, I'm, I'm going to see how she reacts to the, to the film I chose. Uh, <laughs> Which um, um if uh I never seen I seen little little bits and pieces but I never watched the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension before in, in full. Oh, yeah. So I chose that for the next one and I think she'll have enough to talk about with the costumes alone to, to uh hmm. fuel to stoke that fire and then hopefully some love for, for Doctor Peter Weller in that movie. And Man, that's a that's a franchise they need to bring back. Yeah, well, it was well, it was it was teased by many people, you know, but mm. never really happened. It came back in comic book form, though. I think. Yeah, I think so. But you know, get get Kevin Smith out of there. I feel like he's a detriment to negotiating to get that done. <laughs> oh yeah. Remember that Walrus movie, y'all? You know, which I don't yeah. I, I don't hate. You know, I I think it's I think it was a, a move. It's not it's not a great move, but Michael Parks sells it. So there's that. Michael Parks has never been better when he's in that movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I could say if you're gonna watch Tusk, watch it for Michael Parks because he he sells that. Hey man, I just want to make a man into a walrus, and that's your movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that uh, Sid Beef podcast. The next one we're gonna record. And I still have to get the one that we again. I I just been exhausted to do anything. But I'm, I'm I'm gonna release. Two, two episodes next week if we get the other one recorded. Um, Black Mama, White Mama with the Defiant Ones. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, t Tethered Pursuit, I think the episode's called. Where they're, 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 both, they're both prisoners tied together and, you know, trying to escape from their their prisons. And I, it's, it's um, the, 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 the second of Defiant Ones. We're doing it for Sydney Poitier. And why, why not do Black Mama, White Mama with that? Because it's just, it's just fucking enjoyable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, two G Freedom commentaries coming back hopefully soon. We'll, we'll call we'll call it March. I promise in March we're gonna have new episodes, and it's it's not dead. I promise. Um, bring for Springwood. I'm trying to get some episodes together for that too. I'm gonna message those guys. Suzanne has been sick, so it's hard to schedule anything with her to do anything right this second. But um, I gotta say uh, it's been a, it's, it's it's a pleasure to to be on Legion. But if you're listening to this, you say, hey, what's the deal with the other show on the other guy's network? Oh, let me tell you something about it. Uh, the Intestinal Fortitude Network is Android Virus, if you guys know who that is. Uh, it's his network. He, he's been around for, for a very long time. He supported my shows since since they, their inception, pretty much. So I, I, I figured with his budding network, I we give him a show. So that's what Untapped Gems oh. is. And go... Um, 
I, th- I think they're all in one feed right now. So if you type in Intestinal Fortitude Podcast Network on your pod listener of choice, whether it's Spotify, no judgment here, by the way. And um, cause I still have my account. Well, it's like whatever. And iHeartRadio, all those places, you can go listen to it there. And much like this Legion show, and I read the Legion show, but um, enough with... Um, the, the, the talk and shop stuff that the next episode of this you should hear should be on the Legion Patreon, uh, where I, I chose to do, to pair with this, uh, send a maniac to catch a maniac, as the, the line of the film says, the Sylvester Stallone, Wesley Snipes action vehicle, frozen caveman, demolition man. <laughs> oh, it's going to be fun. But, um... We'll get to that, and uh, this has been Last Call of Torchies, and we'll see you guys all again next time. Cheers. Later.